Okay. Habakkuk. Habakkuk. <laughs> All right, we're going to continue in Habakkuk, and we're going to do the verses 6 through 20 tonight. Um, Habakkuk is a hard book. I mean, it's hard, and you, you've probably gleaned that from the last two uh, sections that we've looked at. Um, somebody tell me what Habakkuk's problem is. What's his, what's his issue? Why is he crying out to God? And what does he want? He sees, he sees all the things that are going wrong and doesn't understand why. Why wait? Yeah, he sees all the uh, injustice, all the evil, all the wickedness, all the stuff that's going on. And uh, wickedness at this time is rampant in Judah. Just to give you a quick summary. Uh, Josiah has died, and all his reforms have died with him. King Jehoiakim is now on the throne, and he is a monster, uh, killing prophets and unjustly uh, wreaking havoc among the people, leading them into idolatry. And Habakkuk is crying out from the first chapter of this book, Why? Why are you letting this happen? God, why won't you act? How long must I cry out to you, Habakkuk says. And, and we saw after Habakkuk's first complaint that God responded. Um, and he basically said, you want justice, Habakkuk? Okay, I'm going to give you justice. I'm going to bring Babylon against you. And they're going to destroy you. They're going to destroy Judah. They're going to destroy Jerusalem. And you're going to get justice because I'm going to bring this wicked nation against you. And Habakkuk is appalled. We saw that last week. He is He's flabbergasted as to how this could be. I mean, he basically asked God, how could you do this? I mean, they're, they're worse than we are. I know that we're wicked. He says Judah has, uh, has to repent of their sins. But this is Babylon we're talking about. They're a totally godless society. And on through the end of chapter 1, the beginning of, or at the end of chapter 1 specifically, uh, Habakkuk goes on saying they're, they're just wicked and they're terrible and they're horrible. And you're going to replace a sinful people that's your people with a totally godless, idolatrous, society that, that chews up nations and spit, spits them out. And God responds to Habakkuk in the beginning of chapter 2, which we looked at last week. And he says to Habakkuk, listen, I'm not blind to the fact that Babylon is wicked. I'm not indifferent to the fact that I know what I'm doing when I'm bringing them against you and using them as the instrument of my justice. But he wants Habakkuk to know, I, I see their wickedness too. And then there's a defining moment in the book of Habakkuk. There's only three chapters, so next week we'll probably, it might be two more, but it'll only be two more at the most. It may just be one more after this. But the defining moment in Habakkuk comes in verse 4 of chapter 2, which is really the, the linchpin for the whole book. Man, you got to give me a break. My clicker falls asleep. Just move it forward one time for me, Tressa. There you go. This is the verse, chapter 2, verse 4. Behold, his soul is puffed up. He's talking about Babylon when he's talking about he. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him. He recognizes, and this is a part of, uh, uh, of what God is responding to Habakkuk again, recognizes that Babylon is wicked, recognizes that they are prideful, recognizes that they're idolatrous, but, he says, the righteous shall live by his faith. And we made a big deal out of that last week. Remember? We said it's quoted three times in the New Testament. Uh, the righteous uh, will live by faith is really the rest of this book is explained by that phrase and flows from that phrase. The righteous will live by faith. Prideful Babylon will be judged. God is going to tell Habakkuk. He sees their pride. He sees their wickedness. But in the meantime, while, they're, while you're waiting, Habakkuk, while you're, you're asking why is this happening, why is there so much evil, why is there so much wickedness, this is what you must do. You must live through this time by your faith, even when you can't see how it could work out or, or what God is doing in the midst of this. Everybody with me? So, okay, uh, that's the best sum up I could do of the first two chapters. So tonight we're going to continue to describe, in verses 6 through 20 of chapter 2, he's going to continue to describe Babylon. And what he's showing Habakkuk here, who has complained that there's too much wickedness in Judah, and God said, okay, I'm going to bring Babylon against you, and they're going to destroy you. And he says, wait a minute, you can't do that either. Uh, he is 
complaining that God doesn't see the wickedness of Babylon, God is going to show Habakkuk tonight that he's not partial toward Babylon. He's not tolerating their wickedness in order to punish Judah for her wickedness. He's using them to bring justice, but he will also judge them as well. Verses 6 through 20 is what we call a taunt song. When I say taunt, I mean like mocking, you know, and, and ridiculing. And verses 6 through 20, what we're going to look at is we're going to look at five woes that pronounce uh, judgment in a poetic form. And God is speaking these to the prophet Habakkuk, these truths of judgment. And they're truths according to his nature for all people everywhere. They're general principles that are always true. So we're going to get to glean a lot from them. But it's also specifically applied to Babylon and their destruction of Judea. Okay? Y'all with me? Say I'm with you. I didn't, even, I, I didn't even ask if you were with me. I just said say you're with me. <laughs> Verse 5 we looked at last week. Clicker still ain't working. I charged it up too, man. Just move it forward for him. Thank you. Oh, now it's working. So this is the last verse we looked at last week. Okay? He says, pride, they're prideful, prideful hearts. They, the righteous will live by faith. And then he says, moreover, wine is a traitor. We talked about the translation problem in verse 5, how it's not wine that's the subject, but the arrogant, prideful man that's the subject. His greed is as wide as Sheol, like death, he yet never has enough. Now look at this. He gathers for himself all nations. He's describing Babylon and what Babylon does. He gathers for himself all nations and collects as his own all peoples. Okay? And then verse 6 says... Shall not all these take up their taunt against him with scoffing and riddles? Riddles there is mocking or derision for him and say, and then he begins a list of five woes. Okay, so who are the these? It should be an easy question. I have it highlighted for you. Who are the these? Shall not all these take up their taunt? Who are these? No. They're the nations. You see, the Babylonians gather for himself all nations, right? They're conquering everybody. Babylon is sweeping through the land at this time, uh, destroying everybody, conquering everybody, sweeping through the land. God said, I'm going to bring them against Judah. They're going to destroy Judah. And they, Habakkuk's main complaint was how brutal they are and how, how terrible they are and, and all the destruction, all the mayhem, all the violence, all the, all the injustice, all the wickedness, all the stuff is coming. And God tells Habakkuk, I see their wickedness as well. And he says, he gathers for himself, he's enslaving all the nations, and he collects as his own, meaning he's enslaving all these peoples. But then he asks this question of Habakkuk as he begins this poetic section, and he says, Shall not all these, shall not all these nations that he's collecting amongst themselves, shall not all these nations that he's gathering amongst themselves, shall not all these take up their taunt, their ridicule against him with scoffing, and riddles for him and say, and then he begins this big woe section. There's five of these that we're going to look at. He says, woe to him who heaps up what is not his own. And then a little interjection, for how long? And loads himself with pledges. Pledges are like what we might call collateral. It's a picturesque way of showing Babylon is a debtor that is borrowing, borrowing, storing up debt that's one day going to be called in. Verse 7 says, Will not your debtors suddenly arise, and those awake who will make you uh, tremble? Then you will be spoiled for them because you have plundered many nations. All the remnant of the people shall plunder you. For the blood of man and violence to the earth, to cities and all who dwell in them. So these nations are going to rise up, God says. There's going to be a time. Yes, I know they're wicked. Yes, I know I'm bringing them against you. Yes, I know that it looks like I'm not in control or I'm allowing them to be wicked while I'm punishing you. There's going to come a time where these nations that they're plundering rise up and they're going to be, Babylon's going to be under judgment. And the first thing they're going to be judged for is this woe to those who plunder others. Okay? As they have dealt violently Violently with these nations, they are going to be dealt that violence back in return. 
So verses 6 through 8 that we're looking at on the screen here basically is a woe that is pronounced to those who plunder other people, who steal things that are not their own. Babylon is seen as figuratively as like a borrower that, that whose debtors are arising to call in the debt that they owe. Those who uh, Babylon plundered are going to rise up and make her tremble, it says. Notice the switch between third person and second person. In verse 6 it says, woe to him who heaps up. It's a general principle, right? It's for everybody all times. And then in 7 and 8, it turns from him and says, you will not your debtors suddenly rise. So he's pronouncing a general principle that we can all see as a proverbial truth from God that woe to him that heaps up things that are not his own and loads himself with pledges that uh, he puts himself in the plunderous debt of others. But then he turns and he says, you, he's talking to this Babylonian nation in the hearing of Habakkuk so that he knows that God is not unjust. God sees the wickedness that's happening. And one day those pledges, those debts that uh, Babylon is storing up for himself are going to be called in. See, Babylon, like Assyria before her, piled up the treasure of all the nations that they destroyed or uh, brought into captivity, uh, and they did so at the expense of those who they conquered. They, they unjustly plundered nations, treated people with no worth whatsoever other than to enrich themselves and enslave people. And what God's doing here in this woe is is he's foretelling the judgment that will come upon them. It's going to come upon them suddenly. It says, will not your debtors suddenly arise? And those awake who will make you tremble. So he foretells their judgment in the sense that he's saying, basically, you're storing up this debt for yourself, and one day it will be called in. And what you've given to others will be given to you. You will, uh, in this case, be plundered. Because you have plundered many nations, all the remnant of the people shall plunder you. Um, you're going to pay for the blood that you shed. You're going to pay for the violence that you've committed. All of their debts will be called in. Now, it's very poetic the way it's framed. But in the context of what's happening in the book of Habakkuk, God is showing Habakkuk that he is not acting apart from his nature by allowing the wicked to come in and destroy uh, the, the wicked Judeans. That's Habakkuk's whole complaint. Why is evil flourishing and why are you not doing anything? God says, I am doing something. I'm going to bring Babylon against you. But wait, you can't do that either. They're more wicked than we are. What kind of God are you that's going to tolerate wickedness? God is explaining to Habakkuk, I'm not tolerating wickedness, not at all. I'm not turning a blind eye to the wicked Babylonians. I'm going to bring judgment on Babylon just like I bring judgment on every wicked nation, just like I bring judgment on every, every sinner, every sin, that he will return unto Babylon what she have has given to others. So even now we can take this general principle and we can apply it to our day. You know, when it looks like evil's winning, when it looks like evil's rampant, when it looks like God's not in control, we can trust that there is coming a day of reckoning. I remember talking about the problem of evil and why God allows this or that or the other thing and uh, sitting across from a table with someone and uh, basically, uh, as a younger person, I was just questioning things and said, you know, why does God allow evil? And the person sitting across from me was a lot wiser than me. And they said, well, how much evil should God, you know, what? well, at first they said, what do you want God to do with evil? I want him to destroy evil. I want him to destroy it. Wipe it off the face of the earth. No evil. Everything's good. He says, so you want all evil destroyed. I want all evil destroyed. I want nothing but goodness and righteousness left on the earth. And then he said, what if he decides to start with me and you? <laughs> the problem is there wouldn't be no people left if, they just, if he destroyed all evil. So, so God is acting according to his nature at all times. We know that because his word says so. And we can be assured just because God has not completely and totally and fully dealt with the problem of evil that we see around the world as countries attack other countries and people commit evil acts on each other and all of these things. We say, where is God? Why, have, why did you not act? Why, why didn't you stop this? Why is this happening? Uh, we can't know the answer to that question, but we can be assured based on the promise of God that there will come a day of reckoning. All accounts will be settled. 
Just because God has not totally dealt with the issue uh, in, in perfect judgment yet doesn't mean he's not going to. In fact, God's nature demands that all evil be absolutely punished. And that's why the gospel is so urgent. That's why the gospel is so important. So what do we do in the meantime while we're waiting on God's woe to him who heaps up what is not his own? What do we do in the meantime? Huh? Yeah, that's right. That's right. The righteous will what? Will live by faith. See, we're getting it. Next one is, these are very dense passages. Uh, I really had a hard time figuring out the best way to explain them. The next woe is those who exploit other people. He says, woe to him who gets evil gain for his house to set his nest on high to be safe from the reach of harm. So you see the general principle, the proverb there. Woe to him who builds up their house by evil gain in order to be safe. You know, I set my nest on high to be safe from the reach of, from the reach of harm. I build up my house any way I can. Doesn't matter who I step on. Doesn't matter what I have to do. Doesn't matter what evil things that I have to do or gain. As long as I build up what I need to build up to set myself up and be safe. That's the proverb. Then he turns and looks at Babylon. Verse 10, you have devised shame for your house by cutting off many peoples. You have forfeited your life for the stone will cry out from the wall and the beam from the woodwork respond. So it's a woe to those who build their house with the game, to, who exploit others to build up their own, in this case it would be empire, but for modern context and application it would be anything, to build up your life, to build up your fortune, to build up your house, to build up your business, to build up your anything, to exploit others by evil gain to do this. You do so in order to get the benefit, to make yourself safe, to rest, to have your nest uh, up on high and be safe from the reach of all harm. And then he switches 10 and 11 to talk to Babylon. So Babylon built their empire indeed by exploiting people. Babylon sought after their own glory. In fact, if you look at Daniel chapter 4 verse 30, Nebuchadnezzar even says this. He's the one who came and brought the army against Judea and, and destroyed Jerusalem. He says the king answered in Daniel chapter 4, this is what Nebuchadnezzar said, is not this great Babylon which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty. That's all he cared about. And you, you know what happened in Daniel 4? God reduced him to a, an animal, basically, and he went and lived in a forest for a while. So that was his goal, was to just build up for his glory. And it didn't matter what happened, or what happened to the people, or what happened to the cities or the nations. It didn't matter. Babylon was uh, particularly ruthless in all the things that they did, and they did so for their own glory. So God looks at them and says, uh, in the hearing of Habakkuk, because you uh, have built up your house with evil gain and you thought that this was going to make you safe, God says to them, no, in fact, you've devised shame, not glory, but shame for your house. And you did this by cutting off these people. By, by doing what you've done, by judging and, or, or by bringing plunder and exploiting people and violence and bloodshed and this evil and wickedness that you've done, he says that you have devised shame for your house. God basically declares here that your house won't stand. It's built on evil gain and wickedness. And we know that it didn't stand. Babylon was destroyed as uh, uh, Persia and the Medes came and destroyed them. The house that's built on evil gain is pictured in verse 11, really poetically, as, as a house where the walls and the beams are creaking under the strain. Do you see it? The stone will cry out from the wall, and the beam from the woodwork will respond. So it, it, it's pictured as the house, is, the house is not built to last. It's, it's creaking and straining under the weight of, of, uh, uh, of the builder's sin and, uh, and, and destruction, and it will not stand. The idea is that this house is going to fall. There's really no clearer message in Scripture that the proud will come to ruin. In spite of gaining the whole world, Babylon forfeited their life. That's what he said in verse 10. You forfeit your life. If the righteous live by faith, 
Babylon has forfeited their life in pursuit of wicked gain, as do all who build their houses or their fortunes or their lives or their businesses on evil gain. We are to build our lives on truth. I mean, that's a, a pretty easily gleaned uh, truth from Scripture, to build our lives upon the Word of God, upon the mor morals and values of, of what God has laid out in His Word. Um, we're not to do so uh, to build up and set our nest on high at the expense of others. And many of us might say, you know, you know, I understand, and that's a great, that's a great idealistic thing to shoot for. But uh, I mean, when you're out in the world, you won't succeed unless you do things the way things are done. I mean, this is the way the world works. So what is a righteous person to do in the midst of a time where it seems like I have to have, I have to do what it takes to succeed? What's a righteous person supposed to do? Uh, there, there you got it. You go, guys. The righteous will live by faith. That's what he said in verse 4. All of this flows from that. The righteous will live by faith. Don't build our houses on evil gain. And he's telling Habakkuk, I'm going to judge Babylon for this. And he says, this third woe, woe to the oppressor. Woe to the ones who oppress. This is kind of similar to the last one. Woe to him who builds a town with blood and founds a city on iniquity. He's really looking at the empire that Babylon established. Behold, look at this. It is, is it not from the Lord of hosts? The Lord of hosts, by the way, is the Lord of armies. The Lord that controls armies. That peoples labor merely for fire and nations weary themselves for nothing. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the water waters cover the sea. He says, woe to those who build on bloodshed, a city that's founded upon sin. Um, from the beginning, really, of the biblical record, blood is used, I mean, you all know this, as a descriptor of a violent death. You know, Abel's blood cries out from the ground to God uh, in accusing Cain. Uh, Christ's blood pays for sin because it was through his, his death, his, his violent death, that, that uh, the judgment of sin is given. And so there's nothing but woe and a curse from God to any place that builds on the blood of others. The voices of, of every victim cry out, just like Abel's blood cries out to God. Injustice reaches to the throne room of God Himself. So this woe is really for those who oppress others to gain benefit. So God decrees that their building won't stand. Woe to him who builds a town with blood and founds a city on iniquity. He says, look at this in verse 13. He says, Behold, is it not from the Lord of hosts that peoples labor merely for fire and nations weary themselves for nothing? Now, that's a, that's a really interesting statement when describing Babylon. Because if you were to visit Babylon back in the day, you would have seen grandeur and magnificence. I mean, it was, it was supremely impressive. Uh, extravagant buildings, rich, you know, glorious things. The Hanging Gardens of Babylon was one of the seven wonders of the world. I mean, it was, it was astounding place. God looks at the city, though, and He sees only bloodshed. Sees issues a decree. Says all this is going to come to nothing. He said it's from the Lord. Is it not from the Lord of hosts that you have labored merely for fire? It's going to be destroyed. It's going to be end up as nothing. You've wearied yourself for nothing. Basically, is what he's saying. Now, in this woe twelve through fourteen, there is no you statement. It's all third person. But what he's saying in verse 13 and 14 is whatever is built by this means, by, by injustice, by oppression, building on blood, founding on sin, founding on iniquity, whatever is built by this means is going to fall. The labor that, that you're doing, if you're doing it this way, is only to feed the flames of judgment. That's what he's saying. You're wearying yourself for nothing. And this is from the Lord of hosts, the Lord who controls armies. All the kingdom builders need to hear this. God Himself will have the last word. Verse 14 says, The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. No matter how many empires rise and fall, eventually the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. No kingdom built on anything else will stand. If His glory fills the whole earth, there's not any room for anything else. All other kingdoms are going to be swallowed up. 
And so he's turning to Habakkuk and he's explaining to Habakkuk, I'm going to judge all the wicked. I'm going to judge Babylon. I'm not looking over their wickedness. In fact, one day, all of the kingdoms that are not built upon the rock of God's word, God's truth, Jesus Christ and his kingdom are going to be destroyed because the earth will be filled with the knowledge of glory, his glory, as the waters cover the sea. So in that truth, in light of that reality, that no matter what kingdoms rise, no matter what kingdoms fall, no matter what's happening in the world or in our lives or around us, we know that it's coming a day when the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will fill the earth like the waters cover the sea. What do the righteous do? They live by faith. We're catching on so quick. I'm so proud of y'all. <laughs> Questions, comments, cries of outrage. I'm not leaving. I got kind of a lot to cover, so I'm not leaving much time for discussion. Any questions so far? Okay, good. <clears throat> Next woe is woe to those who humiliate others by violence. Now, this one was particularly tough for me to kind of wrangle through, uh, and, and you'll see why, because... This one is crouched in figurative language of drunkenness. Uh, and it's against those who humiliate and degrade and shame others. He says, Woe to him who makes his neighbors drink. You pour out your wrath and make them drunk in order to gaze at their nakedness. Now, there's, a, there's several translation issues here that I had to kind of sift through. Um, the cup that he's talking about, make them, make them drink, indeed is the cup of wrath. But in the NIV it says wineskin, you know, which is uh, uh, different. Some translations to say the cup of your venom, the cup of your poison. Uh, and to be fair, just to give you the full, you know, if you want the full information, I did read several, several scholars, several commentators that basically took this and said that Babylon made a practice of just getting people drunk. Uh, when they conquered them in order to shame them or, you know, and that may be true, but I couldn't find any source documents to, to actually, you know, I couldn't find where that came from. All I had was what other people said. But just reading the text, to me, it seems like the, the main focus is the humiliation. So it says, woe to him who makes his neighbors drink. It never says wine or anything. He's talking about the cup of wrath. You pour out your wrath and make them drunk. And this is the reason why. In order to gaze at their nakedness, which is in Scripture uh, all the time talking about shame, humiliation, degradation. goes all the way back to Noah and Ham looking at his nakedness and him being shamed and putting a curse on Canaan. Uh, and the idea is that you have degraded and humiliated humiliated and shamed these people by pouring out your wrath upon them. And so verse 16, he turns the corner around and says, you're going to get exactly what you've given. He says, you will have your fill of shame instead of glory. Drink yourself and show your uncircumcision. The cup of the Lord's right hand will come around to you and utter shame will come upon your glory. So he says, because you have shamed and humiliated and all this other stuff, uh, the Lord's wrath is going to be poured out upon you. So they'll be filled with shame and not glory. The cup of the Lord's wrath is a well-known picture in scripture at several places. One of them is Psalm 75, 8, where it says, for in the hand of the Lord there is a cup with foaming wine, well mixed, and he pours out from it, and all the wicked of the earth shall drain it down to the dregs. He's talking about the wrath of God. Basically what Habakkuk, what God is telling Habakkuk is that Babylon is going to be judged. They're going to drink the wine of God's wrath. She who compelled others to drink of her wrath will have the cup of God's wrath poured out upon her. She who, the empire who, who shamed and looked at the, uh, the other nations, nation's nakedness as they, as they destroy them will be shamed and their uncircumcision will be shown. Uh, some translations say instead of uncircumcision will make you stagger. Uh, if your Bible says that, that is, that is a, a valid reading. In fact, in, in the Hebrew, and this is something I learned just this week, in the Hebrew text, there is two, two letters in that word swapped. If you swap them, it means stagger. If you unswap them, it means uncircumcision. And so that's why there's a, a little variance in translation there. So he says, woe to you who humiliate. Woe to who, you who shame by violence. 
And then verse 17 is part of that, that woe. He says, The violence done to Lebanon will overwhelm you, as will the destruction of the beasts that terrified them. For the blood of man and violence to the earth, the cities and all who dwell in them. Le- Lebanon was known for you know, lush forests. The cedars of Lebanon are talked about all through the Psalms. You know, there was uh, one resource that I read said that uh, there was always... Uh, invading armies would always cut down those trees in order to build siege works and, and resources for their armies, kill the animals to feed the armies, all that kind of stuff's going on. And basically, this woe, starting in verse 14 to 17, is just telling them what you have given, the wrath you have poured out to shame and humiliate others, is going to be poured back upon your head. Questions, comments? See, y'all, we're going to do something easy next. The next book's going to be easy. Last thing we'll look at. He says, woe to the idolaters. You remember when we were looking at Habakkuk and his complaint? Uh, I think it was chapter 1, right around verse 15, 16, right in there somewhere. Habakkuk was like, how can you bring Babylon against your people? They're idolaters. They're, they worship their nets. You know, they worship their power. They worship their, Lord, they're idolaters. How can you bless them against your own people? And God, in this long poetic section where he is explaining the judgment he's going to pour out on Babylon, he ends by saying, oh, I see their idolatry as well. In verse 18, he says, what prophet is an idol? When its maker has shaped it, a metal image, a teacher of lies, for its maker trusts in his own creation when he makes speechless idols. Woe to him who says to a wooden thing, awake, to a silent stone, arise. Can this teach? Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in it. What does that mean, summed up? Give me it in a sentence. Well, that's not a sentence, but yeah. Idols are nothing. They, they're not alive. They can't do anything. They can't, they, they can't hear your prayers. They're, they're man's own creation. You make it, they're speechless. They can't talk to you. They can't do anything. It's just a silent stone. You can say arise to it all day long and nothing's going to happen. God's telling him, I see their idolatry. Idolater, uh, Id- idols are just lifeless things. And so he says, woe to those who trust in them. This is the opposite of the right. Righteous will live by faith. Trusting in something that cannot help you, that cannot hear you. Idolatry is, you know, I guess in its basic form, it's just worshiping what we make. And it could be anything, you know. Uh, When I say worshiping an idol today, you know, back then you, you get the picture of like Babylonian army bowing down before a statue or whatever, you know, something like that. But you know, today, especially here in Mulvane, I, I doubt any of y'all are going home and praying to a little figurine on your mantle or something like that. Uh, but idolatry isn't just worshiping a little piece of wood that you carve. It's, it's what is most important in your life. It is what we, sacri- we sacrifice for our God. We live for whatever is our God. We put our hope in whatever is our God. We find our joy in whatever is our God, our purpose. And he's saying, woe to those who, who look to these things. You know? And of course, he is talking about little figurines and idols and metal works and those kind of things. He's saying, woe to those who, who look to these as if they're going to help you, as if they're going to be any benefit to you at all, as if they're going to teach you anything, as if they're even going to hear what you're saying or speak to you. God sees their idolatry. And God is telling Habakkuk through these very, very long woe sections that I understand and I am not oblivious to their wickedness. There is going to come a day of judgment and I'm going to judge them for this. I'm going to judge them for that. I'm going to judge them. Judgment is coming. I am not overlooking their idolatry. Just because you don't see judgment raining down right this moment, Habakkuk, does not mean that judgment is not coming. And then he's, after verse 18 and 19, talking about all of these idols and their uselessness and their lifelessness, he ends in verse 20 with this very incredible Incredible statement when he says, But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. So the Lord alone, all these idols, they can't hear you, they can't speak to you, they're lifeless, they're speechless, they're just made by human hands, blah, blah, blah. Woe to those who trust in them. But on the other hand, the Lord, he is in his holy temple. 
God is ruling from his temple. He's assuring Habakkuk that, yes, I understand, I see all of this wickedness, but God, I am holy. The Lord is in his holy temple. God sees what's happening, and he is in control despite the circumstances. When he says the Lord is in his holy temple, it's really a reference to Psalm uh, 11, verse 4. Where he says, the Lord is in his holy temple. Look at this. The Lord's throne is in heaven. And look what he does from his temple, from his throne. His eyes see, his eyelids test the children of man. He's telling Habakkuk, the Lord is in his holy temple. You need to understand, I see what's going on. I'm in control of what's going on. And then he says, let the earth keep silence before him. This is God's answer after this huge, long, poetic section of woes. This is God's answer to Habakkuk's complaints and his questions. Just like Job, God tells Habakkuk, all you can do is trust that I am working and the creatures that I have created, God might say, you can't presume to know his ways, you can't presume to know his plan, and so you must live by faith And just keep silence before him. Silence here doesn't mean just be quiet. It means be in submission to his will. He is the Lord of all. He is righteous. He is holy. He's accomplishing his purposes. And we must trust what we know of him that he's given us in his word. Even when we can't see it played out in our lives or among us or in the nations around the world. Or in the events that are happening. Because the righteous will live by faith. Questions, comments, cries of outrage? What justice is there for those innocent people who were slain, perhaps even living in faith, and they're dead? Yep. So, I mean, what's your, what's the thing The justice comes when God's justice is poured out. So it may not come in this lifetime. So, for instance, um, Babylon did come against Judea and destroyed them. A lot of people were killed. You know, Psalmist even talks about awful, awful things like babies being dashed on the rocks and things like that that happen. Innocence being killed. Innocent suffering. Um, and God brought judgment upon Babylon by destroying their kingdom. But there is a reckoning. There is a reckoning. So whether it's in this life or it's in the next life, there is a reckoning. Are there any that are innocent? Huh? Are any Well, when he says innocent or righteous here, he's not talking about perfection, sinless. He's talking about those who walk in the fear of the Lord, those who are are, uh, God's people. You know, so he's not meaning, you know, like an an innocent, unjust sufferer would be like a child, you know, killed in a in a battle that's raging. So if there's, you know, you see on the news today in, in Ukraine, those pregnant mothers and, and things like that being, being injured. Being, those are what God would consider innocent. They're not sinless. They're not whatever, but they're caught up in, they're caught up in a, a thing not of their own making and they're receiving violence that they didn't, that they're not a part of, but just being affected by. It makes sense? Did God directly answer that question uh, in Job? Yes. Job was a picture of an innocent sufferer, Yes, yes, he was. In fact, God said Job was righteous before me. He even used the word perfect, I think. But Job was also, at the beginning of Job, God, you know, you got that courtroom scene where Satan comes in and says, let me test this guy. And you see Job's life. It's not that Job was sinless, but he was sacrificing every day. He was following God's command. He was even sacrificing for his children just in case they were you know, sinning against God. So the idea of him being blameless was not that he was sinless, but he was walking, he was walking with, uh, with his God. Yes, yes. Now, that's, that's a different issue. I wouldn't say it's our, our, our innocence is... Huh. Yeah, we're not innocent because of the blood of Christ. We're justified because of the blood of Christ. We're, we're uh, declared not guilty. So I guess that you could say... You could say I guess it's you know, six in one hand, half dozen in the other. But um, I don't like to think of us as innocent, but just forgiven and justified. You know, because we are sinners... Practically, but we are 
perfectly justified and forgiven in the sight of the Father because of the Son. And so, yeah, so for instance, let's, let's, you can take it that way. So there, there is a, a, a big Christian presence in Ukraine. You know, I'm just using that because that's what's on the news every day right now. There's a big, a lot of churches, a lot of church planters, a lot of, a lot of um, schools. I know several people, I don't know them personally, but I know of several people that, that traveled to Kiev over and over again to teach at seminaries and, and schools there. Big Christian presence there. So you could say, you know, if I don't know that this has happened, just using it as a hypothetical, but there's a person who's been washed in the blood of Jesus, perfected in Christ, saved, God sees them as righteous, it's conceivable that they're in a building that a bomb falls on and, and they perish. You know, that doesn't mean that doesn't mean judgment has fallen upon them because they go to be with the Lord. You know, they go to be in their their perfect rest. But it does mean it does mean that uh, there is there is justice for that act and there is a reckoning for that act. The problem, I, I think most people don't have a problem with the fact that judgment's going to come. It may just come in the next life. But a lot of people have a problem with, you know, and this is all hypothetical. I don't know if this happened. What if, what if the guy who blows up the building that the Christian is in and now he awaiting, is awaiting God's justice, what if in the intervening time he becomes a believer? Where's the justice then? Yeah, that's right. Every sin will have justice. So either he will pay for that sin or Jesus Christ will pay for that sin upon the cross. And, and so how justice happens in, is played out in the day-to-day -day lives of people and the, you know, the world as things are going on. Um, we can speculate, we can think about, and I'm real hesitant to declare that, you know, this thing happened because God's reigning is justice down, you know, because it's really not, we, it's not something that we know for sure. But we do know that God is just and that every single sin will have payment made for it. If that's not the case, then God is not just and God is not perfect, which means he is not God. So we can rest and the righteous can live by faith knowing that there is such a thing as justice. It may not come in this life. But it will come in the next, one way or another. Anything else? <laughs> what about them? <laughs> I know, and I said, what about them? Don't they worship Mother Mary? Yeah. I mean, we can get into a big discussion about that if you want. Uh, you're asking me, are they Christians? Well, yeah, I mean, that the, the worship of Mary, the prayers to Mary, and yes, that's idolatry. Uh, I don't have no problem saying that. Absolutely. The worship of icons and saints and those kind of things that, you know, is, is uh, big in Eastern Orthodoxy and things like that. It's idolatry. I don't have no problem saying that either. This caught me off guard a little. I didn't know where. We're... Yeah, so that, there's a big section in idolatry, you know. So, so, yeah, sure. Questions, comments? We ready? <laughs> Tell me the truth. Don't lie in church. Now, God killed Ananias and Sapphira for lying in church. <laughs> Are you enjoying Habakkuk or are you ready to move on to something else? Yeah, well, we got one more chapter, chapter 3, and then we'll be done. And chapter 3 is not as dense poetically. Basically, chapter 3 is going to be in two parts, Habakkuk's um, Habakkuk's oracle his his prayer basically and then his rejoicing in the fact that he is able to live by faith and he's going to say you know no matter what happens i'm going to trust in god basically is how that back ends yes matt no it's different yeah yeah ananias the one who died in chapter five is not the same ananias that goes to paul or saul in chapter nine Okay, good. All right, let's pray. Father, we do love you. God, I pray that you would just use the, use the, the text that we read. God, I know that it's very difficult. I don't know how well it's been explained. God, I pray that you would just impress it upon our hearts and that 
if nothing else, that you would just show us that you are just and you are holy and that you are righteous and that justice is a reality in our universe, in our world, even if we want it to come sooner than it does. God, we pray that uh, you would help us to be the righteous who live by faith and who trust in your word and trust in your nature, even when terrible things are happening and bad things are going on in our world and we don't understand the purpose of the plan of the things that are happening in our own lives, God, we can be those who are righteous and live by faith, knowing that you are the God uh, of justice and of righteousness and all wrongs will be made right one day. God, we look forward to that day when every tear is wiped away, when there's a new heaven and a new earth and sin and evil are completely done away with for all eternity. God, we look forward to that day. Help us to live by faith as we walk through this fallen world until we get to that point. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all.